Thanks so much for joining this session about graph powered machine learning. Just in case it, if you're still wondering why you should stay tuned, GraphML is actually the future of ML. So if we look at uh, the outcomes of like large enterprises such as Uber, Google, uh, LinkedIn, and others, they actually uh, are getting a lot of their breakthrough results currently with graph-powered machine learning. Just an example here on the left, uh, DeepMind actually improved the Google Maps ETA prediction by over 30% by leveraging graph-powered machine learning. Other breakthroughs such as, for example, in computational chemistry, chemistry, or also uh, drug discovery, are also currently often driven by graph-powered machine learning. And if that's not enough, if you just also look at the Gartner predictions, they're actually seeing it as like one of the big trends in data and analytics for 21, and really see it in over 50% of their inquiries uh, surrounding that. Um, I'm Jörg. I'm the uh, head of engineering and machine learning at RangoDB, basically a scalable graph database. But basically, my entire career has been switching back and forth between building large scale distributed machine learning pipelines and actually databases. So I'm currently quite happy I can actually combine that in one role. And uh, also, I'm able to actually uh, talk here at this conference. What will we cover today? Um, I mean, the spectrum is rather uh, large and uh, probably way too much for just a half an hour talk. Uh, so we'll actually focus on uh, those aspects. We'll build up on a little bit of uh, graph uh, insights, talk shortly about graph databases, but then dive into what we can do with um, standard graph analytics, and then go further a bit more into the really graph machine learning with graph embeddings, and then also with uh, graph neural networks. In the end, I'll also provide like a lot more pointers. As you can assume, uh, this right now, it can give you an overview, uh, but we cannot go too deep into any of those topics, unfortunately, due to time. So what is GraphML or what are actually all those different steps? So if I would have to classify GraphML by the complexity of the queries and basically the system uh, addressing that, I would say like the basic a unit, the atomic unit would be a graph query. And this is what you could ask to any graph database out there. And for example, imagine here on the right, we have a graph of like networks, which could be LinkedIn, Facebook, or any other social network interaction graph. And if you ask a simple question, who can introduce me to X? So this is a very simple graph query, basically finding a pass between two nodes in the graph. The next level of complexity is actually where we start analyzing the graph and trying to get insights out of it. So questions here could, for example, be who are the most connected persons in that uh, graph? So who are kind of the important influencers I should talk to if I kind of want to spread uh, or update people here. Other questions could, for example, be where are disjoint uh, subclusters, where are disjoint subcommunity? So if I had to classify it, what kind of uh, what, what, what is graph analytics? It's actually that I'm trying to analyze over like the entirety of that graph, whereas like in graph queries, I often even start with like just a local thing, like the connection between two nodes. Then the like next level, uh, the 2022 level of complexity, that's actually graph machine learning. And uh, this is actually where we start to combine uh, machine learning and machine learning models uh, together with graph. And we can answer like very powerful questions with that. Just imagine, for example, you can ask your graph like, hey, what are actually potential connections in the social network graph, which are not really in the data, but are likely given the information we have here. And this is something you probably know from LinkedIn or Facebook, where you get uh, always those recommendations. Hey, you might want to talk to X. Uh, you might uh, want an introduction to Y. And uh, so this is actually uh, what we can solve by having a machine learning model trained for such kind of predictions together uh, with the graph data at hand. Other questions we can do here, so that was would have been an example for link prediction or relation prediction between nodes. And another example would, for example, be a node feature prediction. So a simple question could you be, uh, who is likely to churn? 
So imagine like your entire group of friends has just moved away from a network provider, from, from a certain service. So that probably is going to increase the chances of you uh, churning as well. So um, we'll see how that actually differs from more traditional machine learning if we view it in the graph context on the next slides. So uh, with that, uh, also we can solve like a wide array of uh, other problems. Um, so as, as we already saw, often we want to see like how are certain things connected that can also be events. Just imagine like your make uh, pipeline for building your tool, so for building your uh, software project, that's actually in its sense is also a graph uh, and dependency graph. Uh, otherwise, we already covered like the question like who is important, who is in, uh, influential, and if we actually extend that, we can also try to uh, identify like unusual behaviors in that graph. So anomaly detection: is there currently someone trying to break in? Is there currently someone trying to break the system? Simply on interaction graphs where we know what are kind of expected uh, behaviors, because this is what we're seeing all over the graph and very localized uh, anomalies in the graph, uh, which might be a sign that something fraud or some new trend is going on there. Also, if we look at uh, knowledge graphs, um, it's a lot about what information can be inferred in terms of semantic inference. So this is another big topic. And also we can actually ask questions about entire graphs. Are they actually the same? So this, for example, comes in if we are looking at protein or molecule structures where we actually want to kind of predict uh, are they the same or as a at least like similar molecules. And yeah, as discussed before, we'll treat that kind of in two different uh, areas. So we'll first be concerned with like graph analytics. And this is basically trying to answer those questions from a graph like community detection, recommendations, past finding, uh, and others. And then in the second part, we'll go a bit more into detail and really try to learn new features about a graph. And that could be, as mentioned, node or link classification, link prediction, or also an entire classification of graph. How is graph machine learning different from, let's call it traditional machine learning, as we probably all know, such as like the standard uh, TensorFlow and other tools? So a uh, kind of default and very common assumption, it's actually not true for all machine learning models, but it's a very common assumption in uh, traditional machine learning, is that individual data points are independent and uh, identically distributed uh, data. So basically, if we would look at this graph of uh, persons here on the right, it would actually mean that uh, we treat each of them uh, independently, each of those persons. Uh, in a graph, we actually have a lot more assumptions about how the neighborhood influences uh, what we are uh, what, what we are trying to predict. So we are actually not seeing individual data points as independent, but we actually see them dependent on the neighborhood we have. And there are a number of common assumptions about that. Or, uh, so one would be homophily, which is basically assumption that all neighbors are similar. So if uh, different or similar nodes in a graph have uh, certain labels, certain properties. This is very likely that the neighboring nodes will have a similar property. And surprisingly, this is actually the case for many real world data sets, such as social, social, uh, social graphs uh, and uh, many others. Uh, furthermore, there's often the assumption that we have structural equivalent nodes. So for example, like a really well-connected influencer nodes, which basically perform similar roles uh, throughout an entire network. So they are also, they are not independent. They actually, as they serve similar roles within a network. And the last kind of assumption we could take, which is pretty much the opposite from uh, the first one, the homophily, is heterophily. And that's that we actually assume that neighbor nodes are different from uh, yeah, their neighbors. And so, for example, one case where this is uh, often coming up is, for example, just in uh, social networks or, for example, uh, dating sites where uh, gender might be, uh, for example, different uh, between neighboring nodes. 
Then uh, again, just briefly coming back to kind of like this uh, learning path uh, towards GraphML or also bridging the gap between graph databases and machine learning. I would actually see that as a continuum, but working for a graph database company, this is a question I actually get asked all the time. And I would actually say the role of a mature graph database is to, uh, is to actually support graph analytics and graph ML as well. Uh, but as mentioned, like it often really starts out with simple graph queries where we try to identify in very explicit patterns, then moves up to more complex graph algorithms. So for example, the finding a shortest path. Uh, what is different about finding the shortest path is that we actually have to keep state uh, throughout that computation. So it's not just like looking at something local, can I find a path, but it's actually uh, more need to keep state here. Next, uh, as mentioned, is graph analytics, where we try to really grab insights from an entire uh, graph, so identifying sub-communities. And then the last step is GraphML, where we actually combine graph and machine learning models to learn new facts about a graph. And the output often is actually also a new graph with, for example, those uh, predicted uh, missing links uh, we had in the first example. Uh, the challenge in this field is that we actually often have different options for even similar queries. So to, to make it concrete, uh, what we said earlier with the graph queries, let's take here in a very common data set, and this is the Cora Citation Network. It's basically a network of uh, papers citing each other. And an easy graph query would be like, who cited paper X? Because it's basically looking up the direct neighborhood uh, of a node in that graph. Then if we look at it from a graph algorithms, graph analytics perspective, what are the most cited papers and what are also like common sub-communities? As you might guess, uh, papers are cited differently. Uh, probably like I will cite more people in the same field. And often I will also cite paper uh, people actually uh, in my direct uh, neighborhood. So for example, being at the same university, uh, which we can discuss about whether that's good from a research perspective, but it actually is often discoverable in real world citation networks. Then if we actually have a trained model and uh, can employ graph ML, uh, we could actually do tasks such as like predicting reviewers, predicting missing citations. So for example, hey, this paper, you've cited all those papers, but most likely you should also look at paper X because it's working in a very similar field or also predicting node label features as we can see here, for example, also class labels uh, for a certain paper, just based on the citation graph. If we just look at one of those tasks, and that would be the last we saw like predicting labels for a certain paper, uh, already there we can deploy a number of different uh, techniques. The probably like one of the more easier ones is label propagation, where each of the neighboring papers, so the cited papers would kind of like send a message uh, with their own labels uh, to that paper. And then we have like an aggregation algorithm uh, which gets all the incoming messages and then selects the most common uh, class labels received by all the cited papers. We could also build a graph convolutional network to predict that. Uh, so basically we have a network predicting uh, a new graph, uh, which would have those class labels, which uh, surprisingly internally often actually works with similar techniques, such as this uh, message passing in between neighboring nodes. And uh, then the last thing uh, is we could actually get an embedding of this graph, meaning we turn we turn the individual nodes into a vector representation. And then uh, as you, uh, if you have any experience with more traditional machine learning tools, we can actually feed it into any traditional machine learning techniques such as support vector machines, or even like a deep neural network. Uh, and then trying to kind of predict those labels based on the uh, vector embeddings created of that graph slash of, of the node representation. So um, this, is what, this is what makes it so hard. The other aspect I think uh, what makes it hard is that we actually often are 
not trained to sync in graphs, we often actually leverage graphs if we draw something on a whiteboard, if we actually sketch a problem. But when trying to solve a problem algorithmically, it's often very challenging for us to transform that into a graph network. So uh, to just take a very example, uh, simple example here for syncing in graphs, that would be collaborative filtering. So collaborative filtering, it's again this assumption of uh, homophily, basically uh, people in your network uh, are actually similar to you. So uh, based on what they have bought, if we classify them as similar to us, uh, we actually get recommendations for what we might be interested in as well. So uh, being in pandemic times, uh, probably a good thing uh, to figure out is like, what do we want to watch uh, tonight and probably we are interested in new stuff because we have watched like all our standard rec by now and uh, so like what how can we build uh, a recommendation system for movies based on a graph uh, question and so if we look at IMDB, IMDB we can express actually rather easily as a bipartite graph. So in a bipartite graph, we have two disjoint set of nodes. So here we got a user set of nodes and movie set of nodes. And basically the edges in between will always go from one node type to the other. So in the IMDB example, like a user would rate a movie, but a movie wouldn't rate another movie, right? It's only going from one node type to another. And so then if we actually uh, state that as, as a graph pro of problem or collaborative filtering, the question is, I want to find highly rated movies by people who are like me, so who also like movies I rated highly. So uh, if we actually go through that, uh, it would be like, the, it's the first stage, we find all the movies. So we're going like from my own user to all the movies in that bipartite graph to the set of movies which I find very cool and I've rated very highly in the past. Then I basically go back and I want to find that set of users who's similar to me. So the set of users who actually also rated those movies very highly. So I'm basically go traversing back this path uh, to the others, to the user domain again of the bipartite graph. And I have a set of users who are based on uh, those uh, ratings I did similar to me. And then I actually, the last step is just to go back on the movie side and find additional movies they ver rated very highly. And this is basically how we can turn such a recommendation problem into a graph problem and thinking about it from a graph perspective. And if we look at what uh, other people like, for example, Uber Eats are doing, they have a great blog post about how they deploy actually graph machine learning uh, to do even more advanced uh, product uh, or restaurant recommendations, dish recommendations. Okay, uh, with that, uh, let's actually move on uh, to the second part, and that would be graph embeddings. Um, so one of the challenge is if we are treating a graph, the graph is actually unstructured data, right? Uh, so we cannot easily put it into a vector form and then feed it into um, a graph neural, uh, into a neural network or other machine learning techniques, because those machine learning techniques, they really like numbers or they really like vectors or even tensors of numbers. And so the challenge is how can we turn something unstructured such as a graph or also like words, uh, which also don't easily transform into uh, a, simply a number into a meaningful embedding. And what do we mean by meaningful embeddings? So we don't want to map uh, each, in the case of words, each word just to a random number because we would lose a a lot of information. So for example, just the relationship between king and queen or man and woman or Spain and Madrid, Italy and Rome, they're actually very similar because they uh, model a certain uh, relationship between those words. And if we would just map it into random space, we would basically lose all those connections. So the challenge is actually how can we train an embedding which helps us uh, to maintain those uh, semantic informations uh, for the relations in between. Um, in uh, Word, uh, for words, this was actually done by word to vec I, due to time, I cannot go uh, into too much detail, but I included like a number of links also in the slides, so feel free to follow them. Uh, but it actually uh, works very similar to the uh, graph case where a common first approach for that was called node to vec 
And so the challenge with uh, no to back or how we do it, we first want to create a sentences uh, we can train by. So we actually, what we first do is we first do a sample um, random walks on our graph. So here, for example, we have random walks of size four, uh, starting from different nodes. And by that, we basically have linear chains uh, of uh, node sequences. And that basically makes it much, much easier because now we can treat it as a structured problem. And uh, we are trying to train a dummy so-called skip gram network by predicting uh, from the first node, we're trying to predict basically all the uh, surrounding nodes in those random walks. And by that, we actually train this dummy network. It actually just has one hidden layer. And in the end, as I said, it's a dummy network. We don't really care about the network uh, at all. But what we care about is the uh, middle layer because the middle hidden uh, layer in that network, it will actually give us that embedding. Um, and here we can basically then see this embedding. We can choose how many dimensions it should have. So usually it has a much lower dimension uh, than the overall dictionary. Uh, but given that we have uh, the uh, similar words in similar neighborhoods, so for example, imagine again like capital and country, they often will be used in like similar uh, um, sentence structures if we look at the word case. And this is actually the same for um, uh, graph cases. So by that, we can actually leverage that hidden layer as a computed embedding. And often just by doing that, we already get like really good outcomes. And uh, this is one of those surprising results of graph machine learning that we actually have some so-called inductive bias. And this usually comes from that uh, the assumption of homophily that actually nodes within that same neighborhood uh, have very similar properties. And as this is the case for many real world data sets, we can actually by just training the skip gram network, which doesn't have like any too much detailed information, it's just a very shallow network, uh, already get like pretty good embeddings, which we can use them for further machine learning tasks, for further machine learning prediction tasks. One of the downsides uh, of no to vec is that uh, actually, if, if we look at that, as soon as the graph changes, it, uh, we would have to retrain it. So it's really just works for static graphs. Um, and uh, furthermore, it also doesn't uh, scale very well. This is why there was actually a lot of research starting in the past seven, eight years around graph neural networks, where we actually really take the uh, graph structure in accounting when building a neural network. And so uh, how, does, how does it work? Like a really good talk is by Peter, for example, down here, linked here. And this, again, is we are taking a graph as input we are transforming it into another graph. And then based on that, we can add features for, for example, for a node classification, uh, for overall graph classification, or also link prediction. So we are basically transforming our graph uh, as part of the uh, neural network uh, tra training. One of the downsides of early uh, graph neural networks was actually their limitations in both uh, the inductiveness and also the scale at which they could be deployed. So this is, for example, where more current research is uh, helping us to overcome that. And I just want to briefly present like two papers, not even go into too much detail, but basically just show you kind of the research direction uh, happening out here. So the first one is actually GraphSage. And if we just dissect the title here, uh, let's look at what that actually means all in here. So uh, the first part uh, this title is concerned about is representation learning on graphs. And this is actually what we did uh, before as well. We want to learn uh, how to represent a graph. Uh, and this is actually typically in some kind of vector or tensor form. And then the two properties uh, which is added by this research is actually the inductive part. Uh, which means that we can go beyond having this fixed size uh, structure. So early approaches, as mentioned, they actually only worked if I had a fixed size graph. And as soon as I would either see a new graph or a changing graph, imagine like Facebook graph, how often that's changing, LinkedIn graph, whenever someone new comes, imagine you would have to retrain that. Of course, that doesn't really work. And so here we actually take it as an inductive problem, which means uh, we can extend it uh, to uh, 
uh, new new graphs we haven't seen before and also to changing graphs. The second aspect this paper tackled was uh, the scalar training. And they basically introduced something uh, like mini batches in, uh, you might know from neural networks, which actually helps uh, this approach to scale out much better across like larger sets of clusters. Whereas with other approaches, often I was mostly limited by the memory of like a single node. Again, just imagine like a Facebook Uber, Uber Eats size graph, this uh, doesn't fit on a single node. The uh, next problem to be tackled is, is that those early papers are actually really just looked at the structure. So basically uh, two nodes are connected and this is the structural representation. But if we look at real world examples, we actually have strong connections and we have weak connections like two cities might be very close to each other, two friends might be very, or two connections might be really close as they write uh, like daily and others are just very brief uh, occurrences. And so as you can imagine, those should actually have different uh, different uh, weights uh, in, in the training. And this is actually where we went through with like graph attention network, where we can actually train the importance uh, and learn the importance uh, of certain re uh, relations uh, of certain uh, nodes in the neighborhood over others. So uh, if we kind of had to uh, sketch uh, the complexity again, as you see, I, I really enjoy doing that. Uh, like the easiest approach is to uh, graph representation or graph machine learning is we just do like simple, uh, simple sampling using deep walk. Then we have node to WAC, which basically comes with more complex sampling algorithms. We have simple graph convolutional networks doing something similar to message passing. Then we have approaches like GraphSage, actually uh, taking that to an inductive and large scale domain and graph attention networks, which introduce the techniques that we can actually have uh, go beyond just the structure of the network and actually take more features also on the edges into account. Thanks so much for listening. I know this was a lot of uh, content and we actually stayed pretty much like at a very high level perspective, but I really hope it gave you like some overview of that current field and also sparked some interest into that. I included a number of links and books here and uh, maybe just as like one of the highlight recommendations is a course I'm actually giving on O'Reilly uh, next week about graph powered machine learning first steps, which will actually cover this in a lot more detail. Otherwise here basically that book recommendation is also covering that entire field from a simple graph representation over graph syncing to graph algorithms, and then also graph powered machine learning and graph representation learning. Uh, with that, again, thanks so much for listening and uh, please uh, don't forget to provide feedback for the session. Uh, also feel free to reach out to me, always happy to improve or discuss uh, more about graph uh, neural networks. Thanks a lot.